Hi, Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and a CLL patient myself, and the co founder, executive vice president, chief medical officer of the nonprofit CLL Society here at ASH 2024 in San Diego, California. I'm Paul Hampel. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, where I focus uh, both from a clinical and research perspective in uh, CLL and uh, the care for patients with CLL and other lymphoid malignancies. Happy to be with you here today, Dr. Kaufman. The team at Mayo has one of the best databases, and you can interrogate that for information, and you work with colleagues to do that. Uh, one of the areas of interest, one of the great unmet needs in CLL is Richter's transformation, but a small percentage of those patients tend to do a little better. That's the ones as Hodgkin's disease, and you've done some recent research on that. Can you tell us a little bit about why you looked at that, why that might be important to a patient, and what you found? Absolutely. So, just as you're saying, uh, Richter transformation being a uh, change from CLL into an aggressive lymphoma and 90% of those roughly being diffuse large B-cell lymphoma uh, type of aggressive lymphoma and the, the second most common but obviously a small subset being Hodgkin lymphoma uh, transformation. So when we're talking about looking at Hodgkin lymphoma transformation, you're looking at a rare presentation of a rare, fortunately rare event uh, altogether. So. Uh, you're right, the Mayo Clinic CLL database is, is a uh, robust and prospectively maintained, meaning someone is, is actually going and following uh, and, and updating this on a, on a weekly basis uh, for our patients. But for a rare event like this, uh, it required collaboration. And fortunately, we have a, a, a group of people uh, who are passionate about, about CLL research and advancing outcomes for patients. Um, in this community. So uh, this is a, a subgroup of patients from a, a larger uh, collaborative effort and cohort of patients, both from Mayo and, and uh, other institutions that uh, Adam Kate, Dr. Kate had led uh, and reported on the outcomes for patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma last ash. So that group of uh, patients uh, altogether with Richter's transformation was over 400. Uh, and the subgroup that we uh, are talking about today and, and that I'll be presenting in a poster this evening uh, is, is uh, 40 odd patients that had Hodgkin lymphoma transplant. That 10% right there. So, it, uh, yeah, I mean, we were all kind of surprised that it actually hit right on what people are commonly quoting in, in papers for this. So, uh, looking at those patients, uh, the, you know, what, what were we trying to not just look at, okay, Hodgkin transformation uh, of CLL in, in patients, uh, but uh, specifically in a contemporary era. And so uh, this is all, this whole cohort, the 400 patients, and then of course in the subgroup, are patients who are chemotherapy naive. So have and that's really important because there's been questions about how does prior chemoimmunotherapy, which essentially anyone who was diagnosed maybe 15 years ago in need of treatment got, how that would affect Richter's transformation, and so you've got some details on that now. Yeah, so uh, this is where the Hodgkin lymphoma transformation story uh, is a little is is again a little bit different. So uh, both in in I guess starting with the diffuse large B cell lymphoma story, where uh, previously we knew prior CLL treatment, which was predominantly chemotherapy treatment, resulted in worse outcomes for patients who had had any uh, prior chemotherapy for their CLL prior to the development of Richter transformation. Then last year we saw that even if they had any prior treatment, then it wasn't chemo. It was any, any treatment whatsoever, monoclonal antibodies or small molecule inhibitors predominantly. The new Sorry, targeted yeah, therapy. targeted drugs, yeah. yeah. Uh, things like brutinib, tyrosine kinase inhibitors like brutinib, micalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib, or venetoclex predominantly as um, the BCL2 inhibitors. They also uh, had worse outcomes, uh, survival outcomes, shorter survival, after development of Richter transformation, if their CLL had been previously treated by, those, uh, by any agents compared to patients who were, had a previous diagnosis of CLL but had not required any therapy prior to the diagnosis of Richter's. And let me just stop you there, but don't most Richter's transformations come after treatment? Is that a fair understanding? Yeah, that's a, uh, the, the, uh, from a different study uh, that uh, it's a difficult thing because of the biases kind of yeah. baked into cohorts when oh. you're looking at this. Uh, we have uh, 
uh, a paper coming out uh, that's been accepted and should be out soon looking uh, that, that gets into the incidence uh, okay. with a bit more granularity and, and looks both in a, a time from diagnosis and a time from therapy and you see a change in the rate of those. Uh, so I think that gets at, at what you're saying for sure. Um, because the, the true relationship between the CLL and the lymphoma, the aggressive lymphoma, is often not known, meaning the, the clonal relatedness, did that lymphoma actually arise from the CLL clone or uh, due to the immune dysfunction and the increased risk of other malignancies in general, is this a unrelated right. de second novo, cancer, yeah. de novo, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so just again, setting the stage here then that uh, in, in large cell lymphoma transformation, both in a chemotherapy era and the targeted therapy era, uh, any prior CLL-directed treatment resulted in worse outcomes uh, for patients uh, after the diagnosis of Richter transformation. Some previous work that uh, we had contributed to and that was led by Dr. Debbie Stevens uh, showed that patients who had received prior purine nucleoside analog chemotherapy this would be like fludarabine, FCR, yeah. um, that would be the main one, which yeah, is or, backbone. Or PCR back in the day, oh, I mean, right, if right. you got it. But, uh, so patients who had received uh, those types of therapies for their CLL and then developed Hodgkin lymphoma transformation also did worse. So again, now we're looking at patients, uh, a small cohort, but the largest one you're going to find uh, to date on, on, uh, with patients who had received no prior chemotherapy who then developed Hodgkin lymphoma transformation. Uh, and we didn't see that is, uh, is the, uh, the kind of top line here, meaning we did not see a difference in outcomes amongst patients who had uh, Hodgkin lymphoma diagnosed concomitantly or concurrently rather with their CLL, so within three months. Patients who had Hodgkin lymphoma diagnosed after uh, their diagnosis of CLL, but with no interval CLL-directed treatment. Uh, and patients who had Hodgkin lymphoma uh, transformation diagnosed after diagnosis of CLL and after receipt of CLL directed treatment, which was not chemotherapy. And so most of this was that, you know, we kind of lump all the targeted agents together, but most of these for this specific study were BTK inhibitors. Some patients had received both a BTK inhibitor and venetoclax sequentially, and most of the patients were actually on their BTK inhibitor at the time of the diagnosis of, of Hodgkin transformation, but the survival outcomes were similar across uh, those three groups, concurrent, no prior therapy, and prior uh, targeted therapy. That's good news. That's I good mean, news. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, it, the drugs aren't going to make the outcomes better. They'd only make them worse. So if they stay the same, then they're the same. And Hodgkin's though it's still a potentially difficult problem to deal with, it has a much better prognosis, the transformation to Hodgkin's than to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that good prognosis, or better prognosis, I should say, is, uh, is also, though, tied to therapy, I think. And this is another important takeaway from the therapy of the Hodgkin lymphoma. So I think uh, this is another important takeaway from our uh, study today and uh, builds upon some prior work that Patients who develop Hodgkin lymphoma transformation should be treated with Hodgkin lymphoma directed regimen. So, in contrast to the large cell lymphoma uh, transformation, where there's a little bit more of uh, heterogeneity in, in what's the best therapy and, and conventional large cell lymphoma regimens do not work very well. Uh, the majority of patients in this study received uh, ABVD, which is the kind of classic Hodgkin lymphoma regimen. Or and that's a chemo immunotherapy. It's, it's, and it's fairly heavy duty, if I recall. Yeah, fairly heavy duty. Uh, and and so, uh, uh, yep, it's a combination of, of kind of conventional chemo, chemo, cytotoxic yeah. chemotherapies, uh, uh, or a newer kind of model of this, which is brentuximab. Uh, Vidotin, uh, which is an antibody drug conjugate, mm -hmm. so uh, a payload uh, of chemo attached to a, an antibody uh, for CD30, a marker on Hodgkin lymphoma cells, uh, with ABD, so still some of those chemo um, chemotherapy agents. And some patients did get uh, what people often refer to as the Andy Evans approach, where it, they kind of uh, break these apart so that it's a, a little, it can be better tolerated and in older or less fit uh, patients. But the main point here is that patients uh, predominantly got Hodgkin lymphoma directed treatments and not, you know, a CLL directed therapy or, or um, you know, some kind of mismatch of that and, and did much, you know, did fairly well then with those. 
of the patients who needed a subsequent line of therapy, all of them got uh, either brentuximab vedotin or an immune checkpoint inhibitor, the kind of immunotherapy that people think of uh, when they see the ads on the news because it's commonly used in melanoma and lung cancer and, and so forth. And those are contemporary, um, you know, standard of care, critical pieces of management of Hodgkin lymphoma de novo, not in the setting of CLL. Uh, and so these patients got kind of good state of the art standard Hodgkin lymphoma therapy and did well. So I think uh, takeaways being the, the impact of prior therapy on outcomes in Hodgkin lymphoma transformation in, a, in the contemporary era is not apparent that patients do well, whether it's across all of those. When you have a patient that develops Hodgkin lymphoma transformation of CLL, you should treat that person like they have uh, Hodgkin lymphoma kind of as if the CLL was, was not present. I think extrapolating from that or, or going, you know, next step from that is, is uh, a SWOG study that was... Uh, SWOG is a large collaborative group of uh, CLL and other doctors across the country. Yeah, kind of across disease types. Right. Uh, and they had a, a cooperative group study that, had, that looked at Hodgkin lymphoma um, management uh, across a large age range with either this combination of brentuximab vedotin and, and some of the chemotherapy agents, uh, uh, AVD, or instead of brentuximab vedotin as the novel component to it, uh, nivolumab, so one of those immune checkpoint inhibitors. And uh, the nivolumab uh, AVD group did better, uh, and then particularly in patients over the age of 60. Uh, and so that's going to be most of our uh, patients who develop Hodgkin lymphoma transformation after CLL. And so uh, now if I, uh, at, which I have, and, and when I see patients with Hodgkin lymphoma transformation of, of CLL, I'm reaching for that regimen. So it sounds to me the bottom line is that if you're one of that unfortunate 5 to 10% of CLL patients who develop Hodgkin's lymphoma, then you hope you're one of the fortunate 10% uh, do, who develop transformation. Yeah, yeah then you hope you're one of that 10% of those Richter's transformation, Richter's disease who gets the Hodgkin's. And then you want to make sure you see an expert because the treatment is, is, um, needs to be understood in the context of what those best options are, which are evolving and the literature is suggesting different treatments for different ages and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, interestingly, one last thing about when this may occur and when, when it occurs, the presentation across all of those groups were the same. How, how patients showed up to their doctor's office with the, how, you know, the size of the lymph nodes, uh, how bright things were on PET-CT, how abnormal the labs were, uh, a tumor marker that we use called LDH or lactogen. Right. So that they look similar across these scenarios. Uh, and, and yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head there. And they need a biopsy. You can't. You need a that. biopsy. And uh, actually, you know, as important as seeing a, an expert, uh, uh, someone with clinical expertise, uh, perhaps more important uh, upstream of that is, is having the pathology reviewed by an expert hematopathologist because um, the, the Hodgkin lymphoma cells, the Reed Sternberg cells, mm -hmm. are the minority. So this is the opposite from most lymphomas. Uh, you take a biopsy and you either see a lot of in, inflammatory infiltrate, so in, in, inflammation cells and not a whole bunch of lymphoma cells, uh, or in the setting of, of CLL, sometimes you see the Hodgkin lymphoma cells, but they're in a sea of, of CLL cells. So uh, it's, it's a difficult case for hematopathologists and expert hematopathology uh, review is, is critical. Excellent tip. And, you, you know, I would say you need a diagnosis, you know, to plan a therapy. I'm only as good as my hematopathologist <laughs> is, is what I, you know. Tell right. people. Any final thoughts or anything you want to share? I know it's a rare issue, but I just want people to be aware of it. I think yeah. the rare issue is actually a good final taking po uh, point here is to not, uh, this isn't a cause for, for alarm for the vast, vast majority of patients. It's good to know that uh, people are trying to better understand it's still, these are unmet need areas and, and higher risk scenarios that come up, but this is not something that, hope, that fortunately the vast majority of uh, our patients with CLL will run into. And one of the things I want to say about the CLL community that I really respect as a patient and a patient advocate is this collaborative nature because nobody's going to get enough of these patients in their own, even a big setting like Mayo yeah. or MD Anderson or you know, the huge institutions. Yeah. They just don't see enough of this. So you need these cooperative groups, sometimes internationally cooperative groups, to pull in enough patients to really get any data that's worth looking at. 
Yeah, absolutely. Kudos to everyone involved in this. And again, Adam kind of took the lead on this uh, last year, and, and it's been a, a, a rich collaboration that's led to good, good data for patients and, and physician scientists. Thanks for all you're doing. Yeah.